we have with us a very, very illustrious panel, and I'm just going to go around uh, the table or the circle. We have Fadi Gandura, who is the founder and the chief executive of Aramex International. Welcome. And Fadi's developed um, a company which I think today is number five in the world of um, international logistics and carriage, um, and would probably take offense if I called him a Jordanian version of DHL. Um, um. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we begin by offending our first panelist. Um, to uh, Fadi's um, right is Omar Al Ghanim, who is Chief Executive Officer of Al Ghanim Industries of Kuwait, uh, which has interest in banking and uh, industry, and a uh, very successful and important group. Across from me is um, Helmi Abulesh, who is the Vice Chairman and Managing Director of the Second Group in Egypt. Uh, which is, has been described to me as an unconventional company. Unconventional largely because it cares a great deal about the social dimension and the social welfare of its workers. And that, unfortunately, is unconventional in today's world. And seated next to Helmi is Prince Khalid bin Bandar bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia. And we welcome you. Unconventional. unconventional uh, views that you hold, not by any means le uh, least, but last in my presentation is Asim Janahi of uh, the Gulf Finance House of Bahrain. Good to have you with us. So I want to start by talking about the fact that as the boom has occurred in recent years, and we've gone from boom to less boom, um, and to economic slump, there really is a uh, clarion call, uh, not just in Wall Street, not just the Obama administration and Tim Geithner and uh, people in uh, London uh, and elsewhere, but also in parts of the various Middle Easts uh, for a back-to-basics approach. Have we gone too far? Have things gotten out of hand? Has there been too much entrepreneurship? So let's start with Omar. Is that a false charge? Is that unfair? Is it something you feel? I, 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 wish, I wish we came from a region where there was too much entrepreneurship. Uh, that, that, would, that would be a wonderful compliment. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we don't come from a region that has too much entrepreneurship, but far too little. Uh, the, 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 you know, we, we have a, a region where it's very difficult for entrepreneurs to be able to go out in the traditional sense and start up businesses. Where the region is 125th out of 180 uh, in terms of contract enforcement, we're number 80 in terms of the ease of starting up businesses in the World Bank report. Uh, it is a very, very challenging place for, for entrepreneurs. And it's also a place that doesn't develop many entrepreneurs. So, so if, you, if you had developed one and, and they were going to go become entrepreneurs, it's, it's a difficult road. But our, our system structurally doesn't even develop entrepreneurs. We, we develop government employees and, uh, and uh, we, we develop bureaucrats. Okay. Um, Fadi, do you agree with that, that we develop too many ministries and bureaucracies? Uh, absolutely. 80% of, uh, of the population of Kuwait works in government. Uh, over, uh, a similar number is, uh, is in the UAE. Uh, uh, Could I ask uh, everyone to turn off their uh, mobile phones, please? Uh, so, yeah, the issue is... is uh, is in education really at the end of the day. So what are we teaching our kids? What sort of skills are we teaching our kids? How are we gonna uh, get these kids to think that uh, uh, entrepreneurship is, uh, is a decent uh, thing to do? You know, like we are still at the basics here. Uh, if you talk to a lot of our uh, uh, high school kids or, or young people that have gone to universities here, and, and the concept of entrepreneurship or free enterprise it's still, is still questioned as a legitimate way of, uh, uh, of existing. I can tell you a lot of the, uh, not me. So, uh, and okay. so anyway, so that's maybe a government official disrupting. Well, that's that's <laughs> the empire strikes back. Um, let, let's, but, let's, but let's pick that up, Fadi, because yeah. um, apart from that, there isn't really the mindset, and I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, if you take the U.S., if you become a millionaire or a billionaire or a successful entrepreneur, 
and they always cite the case of the founder of Domino's Pizza, you have to fail and fail over again and fail and stumble and learn from your mistakes and then succeed. It, in Europe, if you ever go to Chapter 11 or bankruptcy, it's a disgrace for your family. Or you can go to jail in a country like France or Italy for going bankrupt, just for failing. And in your experience in the Middle East? Continue failing. Look, the Middle East is not exactly the, the, the example of, of success. Uh, you know, let, let's be honest well, here. I mean, as an entrepreneur. So, no, I, I know, but, but uh, you know, if we're afraid of failing, that hasn't shown to be a real good example to, to the rest of the world. But, uh, but put that aside because I need to exit the hall properly today. Um, the, the, uh, look, there's a new book that just came out called The Talent Code. So everyone here who, is, who cares a little bit about entrepreneurship and talent and who thinks talent uh, is, is something that you are born with, you're wrong. The Talent Code says that the best way to learn, the best way to learn scientifically proven is by continuously uh, failing uh, at what you do and then every time you fail you do it a little bit better and your system eventually will perfect what you're doing so we need to this basically falls right into how we educate our people and how we uh, 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 give them the concept the concept of uh, of that system in their mind that it, if you are failing then you are learning and and that uh, it's not only a, an issue in the Middle East, by the way. This is a, a global issue, you know. Uh, uh, and we, we need to... Uh, <laughs> I think it's me. So anyway, the, the someone around us. Our phones are off, but let's yeah. put them in the middle. <laughs> phones. Let's see if that makes a difference. Or ask our colleagues from audio to check into it. That's on. It's off. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> no, no, it's off. No, look, somebody, uh, everyone put their phones here, so don't, don't look at me. <laughs> okay, no, but seriously, um, the concept of failing is not... Uh, no, the concept is failing is not there, and the concept of success is even worse here. So celebrating success is, like, questionable also. Because you're always assuming that a successful entrepreneur must have had uh, a stroke of luck somewhere. But luck plays in it. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we have difficulty celebrating success stories. We have difficulty highlighting success stories. We have uh, difficulty discussing why uh, there are successes here. So, and, and, and thus, uh, our kids uh, grow up not knowing that there are success stories. I can tell you our educators here in the public sector do not integrate, do not talk to the private sector at all. So you, you have business schools here that teach complete theory and not integrate with the business sector here, as opposed to, uh, let's say, Stanford University or any, any university in the US where there is a symbiotic relationship between the business community, between venture capital, and between, uh, uh, between the, uh, the, the universities. And thus, you have Googles of this world. And we don't have Googles of this world here because we don't have that. It's as basic as that. It, it has been done somewhere else, by the way. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Okay, fair enough. But Asim, are we dealing not then therefore not so much with balance sheets as with mindsets? And would you agree then with the assertion that in the traditional mindset of many cultures in the Middle East, being a successful company means either being a government contractor or friend of the government or part of the government or a state industry, and I'm not mentioning Dubai as an example, but, uh, or being an old family? as opposed to a upstart entrepreneur? Uh, the bottom line in terms of entrepreneurship, I think it's a matter of a mindset. If you look at uh, Kuwait for their stock exchange, whether it was uh, semi-listed or private companies, in terms of investment companies, I think more than 200 companies came up over the past two and a half to three years. This by itself, maybe it's an entrepreneurship in terms of getting certain themes of companies, and most of them are private sector driven. Then all in all, I think we do have, even within Kuwait, although more than 80 to 88 percent even it's a public sector driven in terms of salary driven, and most of the budget is going to what's called Chapter 11. Then the bottom line, we do have that mindset. Now it comes to the reality. What happened over the past three years, maybe it was easy market to do fundraising. Market was helping you, but 
can you imagine, can we get in terms of real industries, real economy, how many companies came up in terms of that entrepreneurship? I don't think so many. It's, one, it's too difficult to do it. People, they look at the payback period, the financials, and it's easier for you to go and speculate in the market by creating an investment company that you can generate the revenue within the same year versus waiting for three years and from there to the commercial and taking that commercial risk of that industry or manufacturing entity, you end up, the mindset needs what's called a comfort zone. Why? Because the education system, education system raised them up that, okay, this is your summer vacation, you have to travel. I mean, the mindset of the education by itself, it was not challenging. Then you will end up that the end of product, after the graduation, they do want to be in comfort zone. And the easiest way for them to become entrepreneur, they create the talent of comfort zone talent. Back into the family this business after a Wall Street summer? Uh, maybe this is one element in terms of the talent codes. The coding, the more that you have, even for the undergraduates, in the region, some of the universities, they keep you really to work hard. Like in Saudi, if you go during their summer uh, for the uh, undergraduate students, usually they go into like Jubail industrial area just to work out and to get that sharp learning care during the summer holidays. Then all in all, at least the lifestyle will become different in terms of creating certain talents to be accumulated whenever you will face the real challenge. Now it comes, is it family driven or not? You can go and see the listed stocks. You can go and see the listed billionaires of the Middle Eastern market. You will end up, some of them, they were coming with the new concepts to become real leaders, entrepreneurship. Others, they've got it, but at the end of the day, it's a challenging market. It's not that the government, maybe government, they can support you in one of your entities, but if you are well diversified, you have so many challenges, and with the new reforms that's happening, like the three Middle East, one of them within the GCC, that you have to be transparent. You have right now the life of the parliament. Then no way you can get the free ride. The market's becoming difficult, more difficult than whatever you can score within your balance sheet or income statement, you have to do it the hard way. And this by itself, it creates certain challenges for you in order to, re to reach that level. Well, you, you, you stimulate two thoughts in my mind that are competing, and they concern Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. In Kuwait, perhaps the most entrepreneurial moment in your history uh, was in 1982, when I, as a young financial journalist, was dispatched to Kuwait to track how $87 billion of post-dated checks were done in the Souk al-Manak for stock trades. That was perhaps getting a little bit ahead of your time there, and, 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 and <laughs> didn't end so well. Um, but seriously, coming back to Saudi, uh, Your Excellency, King Abdullah has been a very enlightened leader. He's just had a cabinet reshuffle, the first female in the Saudi cabinet. Uh, the King Abdullah University investments, the Saudi investments by Governor Amr Daba, the various initiatives that are going forward are significant, illuminated, and represent change and attempts at reform in a society that has not always welcomed reform. Give us a report card. How are you doing? Um, difficult question. Uh, I think, you know, Saudi Arabia in the last three years, uh, I've never seen the energy in the young people, um, the, the desire to do things like I have in, in the last three years. Uh, there's, a, there's a belief that finally we are, it's not just about <coughs> reform and the changes, it's about filling the gaps that we've had throughout our development in the past. Um, our education system, you know, in, in Saudi, our education system, I've always said, teaches people to ride a train. You get on the train tracks and in 10 years, I'll be here. So in two years, I'll be married, I have two children in five years, I'll be promoted in 10 years. And that's one of the biggest problems we've had with, with producing entrepreneurial spirit in, in Saudi Arabia. These changes, when, when people look at, at uh, you know, His Majesty, Allah said, Mumashallah, is, is a fairly, fairly old gentleman. And when people say, see that he's willing to give up 
and change and do things that he may not believe are right for him, but believes are right for, for another generation, it really spurs them on. It's creating a lot of energy. We have a long way to go. So, so far, I think, you know, for us, the tiny bit which may seem to a lot of people has changed, for us is huge leaps and bounds. Um, you know, His Majesty attended for the first time in history for a king of Saudi Arabia, a woman's graduation at a university. That's never happened before. Um, so I'd give him an A plus, but I am slightly biased. No, no, I would give him an A plus as well, and I think the world would give His Majesty an A plus. But the question I was asking was not that. Uh, let me rephrase it politely but differently. Is His Majesty much cooler and much younger and much more hip and Facebooky and reform oriented than most of his society? Well, well, I wouldn't go as, as much as Facebook here. Okay, so. <laughs> no, but is he essentially avant-garde and, and ahead of parts of his establishment? Now you really put me on the spot. Um, it's the job of a moderator. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, we, I can, would, we can help you. <laughs> I, I would Fadi's say, ready to help. I would say that, you know, certainly personally, he's very conservative. Um, but he, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, that, that I'd like to point out, and he said this publicly, I'm king, my responsibility is this nation. This nation is a young nation. I need to create a nation for the people, not for me. I'm on my way out. And he said that very publicly. Um, which, that is incredibly enlightened and very difficult thing for a king to do. Um, so I think he understands the hip. Uh, although he, he uh, I saw him once try and write a text message. Didn't work so well. No. So Facebook is really far away. Huh? And, uh, <laughs> we, we're trying to teach him Twitter and that's <laughs> certainly not going to happen. You can hire people to Twitter for you these days. Okay, um, moving, uh, and thank you for that, moving to perhaps um, the hippest <coughs> social entrepreneur on this panel, if I may put it that way, Helmi. By far. Helmi, uh, I'm going to ask you to describe how it is that you have created in Egypt a business that is making money, providing more social welfare for its workforce than many companies I'm aware of in the Middle East or elsewhere. Um, what is it you're doing? <coughs> no. Let me try to explain it in a few words this way. In 1977, it was my father who had the dream or the vision of, of this initiative of SECAM, which by the way means the living force uh, or vitality from the sun. But well, the idea was, and this is why it's unconventional and, and fits to the topic, in 1977, eh, it was the first initiative of organic farming in the Arab region or in Africa. So it was something totally new. In 1977, it was the first initiative which wanted to achieve a, a fair trade certification. Nowadays, it's well known. In 1977, nobody used the term fair trade in the world. In 1977, he wanted to create a local market for organic products in Egypt with a GDP of $1,000 per capita, and organic products are expensive and sold in Germany where you have $40,000 per capita. So how to create a market for organic products in Egypt? Totally unconventional. He wanted to invest part of profits, which he did not yet achieve, into R&D and innovation, 10% uh, of profits. So from where the profits, first of all, and from organic farming, which is fair trade, and going to the local market. Eh? And all this based on the belief that you, he, can be, he can create a competitive community, competitive, globally competitive community, by investing into the people individually and as a team, by giving them back ownership of their destinies. And this is what the issue of entrepreneurship is all about. Eh? If I believe I can create my future, then I'm an entrepreneur. If I believe somebody else will create it, then I'm a follower, and this is also okay and needed, but it's exactly this, how to give back ownership. And this is what our generations lost over a few uh, generations. And I think originally our region has a lot of entrepreneurship spirit, but through many, many issues, we lost it. So how to give back uh, this ownership, how to, to invest into people and how to make the equation of one and one equals 100, and not one and one equals one or zero. So how 
the, the, the sum of people will, will be much more powerful than the number of the people. And last not least, how, uh, and, and, and again the term of corporate social responsibility, which was mentioned today here in every single session I attended, was not yet created in 1977. And he said, and I want to invest into our community because this will, again, enhance our own performance because then we will be carried by this community and will be able to achieve, <coughs> outperform our competition. So giving to the community and by giving to the community, getting more competitive. All these were unconventional ideas. And over the last 30 years, they have been, they are now on the way of realization. I think I can say that we have done some steps into the, the dream or 2,000 people are working now. We are serving 30,000 people in the area. We are market leaders in the local market for organic products in many, many uh, product segments and so on. Uh, and about 1% of Egypt's agricultural surface is now organic certified. And it's growing very fast at 20, 30%. So the, the organic movement has really, is now a reality. So all this was very, very unconventional in 1977. The question is, did what is going to happen now through the financial crisis over the last years and in the future? And can these ideas sustain or improve or will they be stopped? Will it be more difficult? It's a question which we also have. And what's I the answer to that question? I think my perspective is very clear on this. I think over the last two years, uh, three years, uh, many sessions I attended at the World Economic Forum, ABC and so on, it's not only the financial crisis and the economic uh, crisis which is really a problem for the world. I think for me personally, climate change, water scarcity and peak oil are as uh, much a, a challenge of this century for, for our society. And therefore, uh, for me, the whole question of green uh, industries, clean industries, uh, sustainability, and sustainable development in large, where it's about economic gains, financial profits, but also social and environmental sustainable uh, results. I think this is where the world is going to go. I think we are on this, and we will be, uh, we were unconventional yesterday, we will be the mainstream tomorrow, and we have to be very, very fast to have new, innovative, unconventional ideas in the field of renewable energy. We have to prove to the world that sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, can stop climate change. That it can handle the water scarcity of the region much better than anything else. That we can save a lot of energy uh, in, in the field of organic farming. So we have now to be more innovative, to, to really show that what we did over the last 30 years is now an opportunity for growth, new investments and new employments in the region. But Omar, Asim, how many Helmis are there in Kuwait or Bahrain? People like him. How, how many are like him in Bahrain? Yeah, or in Kuwait? Oh, Kuwait. No, Kuwait. people who are in, uh, well, in, the, in the region. I mean, uh, look, uh, globally. Well, let's broaden it across. Uh, they the are a business that has uh, social. Uh, I'm sorry, Omar. Yeah, that has social. Uh, impact and financial impact completely integrated in strategy. So it's yeah. not about CSR, really. I mean, they are a company so that in their is, DNA. It, is it, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the answer is there are not many across the region. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, but there will be more and more, I'm sure. More and more people start to think this way, and more and more people will do this and much better things in, in, in their businesses. But what will be the effect of the backlash caused by the financial crisis in the short term on your kind of stuff? How will the forces of conservatism threaten your type of business? I, I was a little bit uh, worried, and I was very happy to see that at least the political leaders and many, many of the, of the, of the economic leaders, business leaders, and civil society in these difficult times were claiming that renewable energy will create more jobs than automotive industry in Germany in the year 2012. We have five million jobs in the renewable and clean tech industries in the, in the United States. Gordon Brown said, we have to continue sustainable development. There is no other way. I mean, even in these difficult times when it was all about uh, can we go on and can we not, I think people understand that the future uh, of our planet and uh, the future of sustainable economic development, not cross development, there's a difference between these two terms, 
lies uh, with a sound, uh, with the inclusion of sound social and environmental practices in our uh, business models. And it's possible. Uh, what we did the last 200 years to externalize all costs we could externalize, and therefore organic products seem to be more expensive than conventional products because you didn't see health impact, environmental impact, social impact of my product. You couldn't see that there's so much waste anywhere to the product I did produce, which nobody is paying for, and so on. All this will change. Eh? With the scarcity of raw materials and energy and sources, we will, get, we will need to get much more uh, efficient and, uh, and sustainable. And so I, I'm, I'm convinced this is the future. And, and, and that your model can be exported and spread around the region. Absolutely. Yes. And that's an extreme positive model of social responsibility in business. Let's come back to the more basic issue of unconventional capitalism, which you gentlemen represent, simply because you're entrepreneurial and you've been aggressive in societies that don't normally brook that. So how do you deal with that? How do you grow that spirit? And how much of a threat is the backlash of conservatism? Uh, coming from the industry itself, Islamic banking industry, uh, it started like 30, 35 years back. It started with what's called the uh, plain vanilla type of Islamic products. This was during the 70s and the 80s. Then it went into the second generation in the ni early 90s. The third generation came up with little bit sophisticated products, which was investment banking, late 90s. And with the new millennium, then it started the real generation of new frontiers of Islamic products. This is where it has been more advanced, but was not too aggressive in terms of looking at the normal, conventional type of financial instruments, like not looking at the real derivatives versus real asset-backed securities, in which you've seen right now fixed income instruments. Uh, conventionally, it was there. But for the Islamic, they started like what's called the Sukuk, fixed income instruments, started just mid-2005 forward in terms of looking at the market size. Then all in all, the way that to drive and to be innovative in such industry, it was a little bit open. And this is where I've mentioned to you, it was easier in terms of a mindset to get into soft type of development rather than being into hard type of economies in terms of creating that innovation in an unconventional way. Yeah, you've just given a very, very articulate description of the origins of Islamic finance, of which you are a pillar and a successful practitioner and innovator. You didn't answer my question, which was about <laughs> how um, the forces of conservatism will threaten entrepreneurship. But let's come back to that. Let's come back to that. Let me stay with Islamic what finance. What Let me stay with his, his point for a moment, because let's develop it. Islamic finance is more than just takafuls and sukuts. Right. It's a broader uh, mindset that combines elements of sharia, elements of spiritual, elements of ethics, elements of, pro of non-profit profits, for society. Um, if you go to Kuala Lumpur, they tell you they are the innovators of Islamic finance and the center. If you go to London, people like HSBC will tell you they are actually ahead, or the Dow Jones Sharia Index will tell you they're ahead. Or if you go to Bahrain, they'll tell you they're ahead. I'm sure in Kuwait, you'll say you're ahead. So the question is, A, is Islamic finance something that can be a benefit to entrepreneurship? Sounds like a contradiction, that question, or to innovation in the Ummah and in the Middle East? Uh, and two, how is Islamic finance faring during the crisis? Uh, to see the level of uh, entrepreneurs came up from the Islamic banking industry over the past three to five years, comparing them to all other sectors, I think you would see a lot of them. Yeah. That they have been into Facebook of whatever industries versus uh, Islamic finance then it's a yes, you can be innovative and creative. Why? Because the new generation of Islamic banking and finance, they are coming up with the new products. Now, to take you back into the guidelines and Sharia, yes, there are certain guidelines, it depends. So each institution has its own Sharia committee, and the Sharia committees depends into the advisors and the advisors. Sharia in Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur is different from Sharia in, in Yes, but the, gen the general guidelines is the same, the code of ethics, is the same. Sure. It's a matter of interpretation out of each uh, country or provinces, even within Saudi itself. Then all in all, there, there will be a, an index for that as what's called Code of Ethics of Sharia. 
then all in all, it's not a bottleneck that it stops you from innovating. Now, getting back to the crisis, crisis maybe it helped a little bit to realize that Islamic banking and finance got a better credit in terms of the international arena to watch and say, okay, maybe because there was not a lot of a leverage type of a business because the business model doesn't help you to take a huge debt versus smaller assets. Maybe this was a protection. Another level it was you couldn't do any securitization of a paper in terms of introducing uh, whatever derivatives versus a real asset-backed security. This was another protection. Then all in all, it opened up that maybe this is partial alternative to look at a little bit more secure industry. Now, the overall sentiment is the same. Because at the end, if there is a scarcity of liquidity, it's a scarcity of liquidity. To end up with we're generating, if you're looking at the three Middle East, as you've mentioned, and looking at GCC, bottom line is driven by the main revenue engine for that. That's into the oil prices, oil and gas. Then all in all, most of the private sector, depending on the public, the way that they are doing their spending and their budget. And you have seen the budget is driven by oil prices to reach at 50 or 60 within the GCC countries in terms of budgeting themselves. Uh, Actually, if I can yes. with humbly correct you, I believe in Saudi Arabia, the calculation for the next five years of economic planning and growth has been at a 47 to 49 dollar per barrel level. So they actually got it right. And there are a few other countries where it's been lower than 50s and 60, and, and that's a good thing uh, over the next five years. But you're right, generally, that, that that's an issue. But uh, you're extremely articulate, but you're not answering my questions. How is Islamic finance being hit or not hit but by but the global but crisis? But I think you raised uh, raise an issue, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you raised an issue, and we're talking about the price of oil and talking about development uh, together. Why? Unconventional uh, capitalism tells us we have to stop relying about the price of, on the price of oil as an index of how we develop and not develop. Being economies that are too dependent, even us on the sidelines here, you mean in the Levant and the other two Middle Easts that don't have the oil, continuously look at the oil price as our indicator of development. When is it that the region is going to finally say, I want to develop other industries and, and, and stop uh, relying on and the oil price, which is, when, which is, which is, which is a product that is diminishing. It is going. It is going to go away. Well, hang on. When, Egy Egypt doesn't when, have oil, and they have a 6% to now a 4% growth rate. No, so uh, not anymore. They used so to. No, they were at 6 they and 7. To, now we're talking about to today. We're talking about today. Okay. And, and, and Egypt is very much dependent on its foreign investment on, com on money coming from the Gulf. So when you talk to an Egyptian uh, 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 government official, he'd tell you, well, you know, uh, the, the situation, I, I can tell you the Jordanians do the same and the Lebanese do the same and every country that doesn't have oil will raise the issue and say, you know, uh, the people in the Gulf today are busy with themselves because the oil price went down. Well, okay, good. Good, I'm happy. You know, the best thing that could happen to the region is that the oil price remains at a constant level. I don't want to uh, uh, give a, gl a gloom and doom uh, story here. But say let's say $75? Um, I don't know. $50, uh, $50 where, where we are continuously thinking of how we are going to reform our economies, how are, going, uh, how are we going to make them more attractive for foreign yeah. investment, not because we want foreign money to come into the Gulf, mm -hmm. but because we want to, uh, to get foreign knowledge and foreign capabilities so that we are, as we integrate with the global economy, we get, we get that capability so that we eventually diversify away diversify away and, uh, and entrepreneurship is, is the story. So entrepreneurship means we are creating jobs that are outside the conventional, uh, uh, the conventional story. I Why? bet you everyone on this that's, panel that's agrees with you. But, but I know. But, but nobody but, can tell you how uh, to do uh, but, it. But we're still saying, we're still talking about the price of oil and, and development. And you okay. know, it's, it's, a, it's a boring story, really. Let's talk about how to do it. Because your point is extremely yeah, well I'm taken. We Clean are, energy I'll is one of the smartest things I'll that's going you, on in the GCC right now. Uh, we do it by, by, by look, the problem in the region today, the problem in the region today is we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars in building buildings. We're not mentioning we Dubai. We haven't spent as much. Uh, why, why don't we take risk on our future generation of the youth? So if we are spending billions on building so many buildings that are 5 million feet tall, while we're not spending as much money on our schools. Can, can we take that statement in an Oxford debate style and ask others to comment on it? No, I'm just building, billions and billions on we buildings we and buildings. To, we need to get Fadi has put, we're at the Oxford Debating Society now, Fadi has put on the table
billions and billions on buildings and billions. Each of you please comment on that statement. Uh, Fadi has Aramex. Aramex is cross-listed in Dubai, right? Dubai financial market. It's, uh, it's singularly listed. Singular. Somebody shut my mouth. <laughs> 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 you cannot do that. <laughs> Look, it's not fair. If you don't want me to speak, I will leave. But you can't shut my microphone. Uh, the management is here, not over there. Audio, let's have that mic back, please. Yeah. If, if you don't want me to speak, tell me not to speak, but don't shut my no, mic. No, you've made a point about yeah. billions and billions on buildings and buildings rather than a clever diversification policy that has a medium-term vision. Asim? Okay. In order to avoid uh, depending on the oil, of oil prices, one thing you have to have a mindset of to become an India or China. This is where they are depending on industries and so forth. Now, coming to the buildings and buildings, the problem of buildings and buildings creating certain wealth that they have done trading to have extra cash to trade the equity market and other things to get into circulation. Maybe the mindset was wrong in terms of getting to that aggressiveness, but the bottom line, these are the two asset classes within the region that they have. Either they get into real estate or, or they get into the equity market. They don't have alternatives. It's a level of comfort zone. This is what they know. They don't want to get into what this guy is doing in terms of doing acquisition in Southeast Asia, okay. getting into manufacturing facilities. Omar. You, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, hi, I'm, I'm an oil addict. <laughs> and, and we really are addicted to oil. And, and the whole region, we're addicted to oil. And, and like most addictions, to, to Fadi's point, you, you don't acknowledge you have a problem until you hit rock bottom. And, and, and I agree that a sustained period of low oil prices would really make the GCC in particular face up to the fact that, that we, we, we don't have a value-add uh, economy. We, we do spend way too much money on buildings and, and we invest in, in, our, in our equity markets, but we don't have a, val a, a value-add GDP. Some of that's going on in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and, and you see a lot of training happening with the younger people. But overall, it really goes back to an issue of education. We're not preparing our people to be able to create value. We're not preparing our people to be able to do anything but invest in very tall buildings or play, speculate on, 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 the, on the equity markets. We're not creating a generation of people. We have the youngest, we have the youngest population in the world. And, and we're, we're training our population to either become government employees or build another apartment building and rent it out, and th because that's the extent to where our business models go. Okay, but Klaus Schwab asked us to be proactive and not just so, describe problems, but come up with solutions. So how do you fix that over time, and how many generations does it take to fix? Well, going? Ed education? Uh, let, 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 you're putting on the table. Let, let, me, let me touch on education. I, I, I think that, that uh, if, you, if you take a look at schooling across the region, it is very ineffective. And there, there, there are a couple of ways where the private sector can come in and be able to affect change. The, the, the problem is if you go to any ministry of education across the region, they have studies from the best consultancy firms around the world that, that will exactly address all of their issues. So those are all sitting on, on, on shelves collecting dust because they're, they're people's jobs at stakes and they're people who are in power there who will lose their jobs. Uh, I think that there, there's, I'm, I'm going to make a plug, but, but for junior achievement uh, and jazz across the Middle East is, is a wonderful program. Uh, there are over half a million kids going through that a year now. Uh, there are over 100,000 <laughs> kids going through it a year in Jordan. Uh, if, if you look at a sample group of kids that have gone through that, entrepreneurialism rose by four times amongst a sample group of kids that actually went through that program because it shows them that there's another path. There's another path b besides going and becoming a government employee. There's another path doing exactly what your parents want you to do. And, and that there, there are other options. Uh, but let's stay and get real. How many generations does it take to achieve the kind of change you're talking at, about? At the One, rates, two, or three? At the, rates, at the rates we're going at now, uh, it will not be achieved and it will not be addressed. Uh, because we're, uh, we're, the population's growing at such a fast rate. And, and, and there, you there's- you double negative just now? Yeah. <laughs> well, it won't, the, it won't not, you mean it will be a No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, you will not address the issue if you keep addressing it at the same rate that you're addressing it now. The population. It's not a question of one or two or three generations. I, it just I won't think, happen. In our I don't think it will happen at all. Okay. I, I don't think, I, you're not, you, you, some, the structural change needs to take uh -huh. place. Well, no, Helmi wants to jump in. You want to jump in and His Highness wants to jump in. So um, okay. one, two, three. I, I'm trying to catch up with all the questions you asked to all of us that I did not answer. So I'm trying now to <laughs> jump my point of view on your last question. What can be done on the short term? Uh, can be looked to, in, you know, and I'm speaking now from my Egyptian perspective, which is different to the perspective of the, of the, of the Gulf, 
we have a growing population. It's not the building issue in Egypt which is leading our economic costs. It's it's industry, it's services, it's agriculture. It's, it's four million people on one dollar a day. And still we have a huge issue and we want to improve uh, the standard of living and we want to employ the one million young Egyptians coming to the job market every year and so on. So there are challenges but it's not the building issue. So what I envision at least back coming back to my dream that through uh, something like a national sustainable development strategy you will find out that all the new buildings and old buildings in Egypt you could improve the energy efficiency of these buildings 35 or 40 percent and uh, more and you could do a lot of savings on the energy side you can employ millions of people you can create added value entrepreneurship and not entrepreneurship jobs you can do the same in transportation and sustainable transportation the concepts of sustainable cities with all the services related without cars with cars electro cars i don't know what there are many many opportunities even for a country because i i had these discussions in egypt and then the question was yeah this is something for germany this has to be a very wealthy country too. Do you have any German blood? No, alhamdulillah. You realize you sound, I mean, okay, but you sound, I, you sound I, like I, a I'm German. I'm half Austrian. Green. Das macht nichts, das ist kein Problem. Das, das geht, okay. ja, das ist, das ist gut. <laughs> Dann, wir können von Wiener Schnitzel reden, nachher. Yeah. The point is... <laughs> yeah. I said we can have a Schnitzel later. No, the point is that, that you sound like a European green politician, and I bet that most parts of the Middle East, you sound like a Martian. Like a what? Some buddies from the planet Mars, <laughs> far away. <laughs> no, because your ideas are very <laughs> radical. <laughs> <laughs> no? They're great, but they're <laughs> radical for many parts of the Middle East. I, I they're think very far ahead. Look, I want to, to tell you, agriculture is still in the private sector, at least from the private sector perspective, employing most of the Egyptians, 35% nearly of the population. And agriculture has the constraint of uh, gross on the one side and water scarcity on the other side and through sustainable agriculture, sustainable ways of me dealing with water and soil we could create in Egypt two million new uh, fadans of, of arable land with the same quantity of water today and employ some five, six hundred thousand people more in agriculture. So there are many, many creative solutions. I know that we are still at the very beginning, but I want to tell you, I have here some friends from the Egyptian Junior Business Association. There are others Wait, where in are Egypt. They? Show us your hands. They, they are here. I don't know. Or, or they jumped out. They left. <laughs> they're back there. They left. Okay. And they're here, huh? you see. And we are discussing these issues with the business associations. We are discussing these issues with politicians. We are discussing these issues in our competitiveness reports and councils, uh, civil society, and so on. And I can tell you the same is going on in many other Arab countries. Fadi is doing so, but he is not uh, uh, is speaking about it. Um, and Aramex is, is, is on the way of, 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 of sustainability and saving energy and, uh, and all this kind of stuff. So I think that there is an opportunity which can uh, really create uh, a better future and development for our countries based on sustainable development. I know you're next, but I just can't no, resist I, I, this. I don't mind. Uh, Your Excellency, Please. Saudi Arabia is interested in cultivating food in all sorts of parts of the world on a kind of rental basis. Why don't you get together with this gentleman and um, see what you can import? I think that's an excellent idea. Um, you know, we've, and again, this is a personal opinion, not everyone agrees with me. We've in the last 20 years embarked on a policy of trying to feed our own country through our own country, which is, in all fairness, there's one reason why uh, Saudi Arabia has never been, or Arabia has never really been invaded or conquered, because nobody wants to be there. There's nothing there. It's sand, and, and that's about it. Um, in the 1930s, someone put a finger in the ground, and then oil came out, and then we became very popular all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's a mistake, and the, the intelligent thing for us to do would be to find, sus I mean, if you think about it, the population of the world is growing, for not just the Middle East, the whole world. Amount of arable land is decreasing. And this is, in my opinion, a very silly thing. We should concentrate on where they have arable land. I mean, Egypt is famous historically for four, five, s 10,000 years. I think we need an unconventional capitalism road trip to Saudi Arabia that you, Your Excellency, organize, inviting the other people on this panel to come through and share their experiences in Jeddah and Riyadh. Uh, they're all more than welcome. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Fadi. 
what's the question? <laughs> well, I'm, not I'm not asking you. You're going to catch no, me. I, I, look, you, you, you spoke about, about how many generations uh, it's going to take. I, look, the issue of, of, of capitalism in general is under question today. And I, I was just a minute before I entered uh, with my good friend Hala here, who is our Minister of Social Development here in Jordan, and who is a, a person that understands uh, social issues very well. And, and we were debating. Uh, whether capitalism is under threat as a concept uh, altogether. So uh, unconventional capitalism, what does that mean? Does that mean conventional capitalism? So what is conventional capitalism? Cap uh, let's define capitalism at this stage today. Is it the Anglo-Saxon capitalism that ruined, uh, that, that ruined the financial markets in the past uh, six uh, or eight months? What, what is it? Uh, is the region part of that and parcel of that uh, uh, capitalism? We need to... What did you and the minister conclude? We, we had a small fight when I came here. <laughs> so... Uh, but yet I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, the, the question that, 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 look, open markets, there is no, uh, uh, the communism and socialism is not going to work. We, we, we've seen the countries, there are still a few of them around the region also, and we know that they're not functioning. They are shy about, about their yeah. capitalism. But, but we need to finally, we need to finally uh, decide the role, uh, as, as Helmi was saying, uh, it d define the roles uh, and the responsibilities of who is responsible for development in, in, in the region. And historically, governments alone were responsible for development. The story and the new narrative today is that business cannot be socially irresponsible anymore, cannot be societally irresponsible. That's not socially. Social, social is a very difficult uh, word to use today uh, because it's opposed to capitalism. Uh, forget that. Let's talk about societal responsibility. Societal responsibility, meaning the, the how we affect society around us uh, in terms of either polluting or either employing or either educating. Uh, the private sector has to have a role and has to step up to its responsibility today in uh, uh, proposing its solutions along with government and along with civil society on how we think the future of these regions need to be, the, uh, to be addressed. Governments have, uh, uh, have uh, you know, one way or another failed, not totally. I don't want to be totally negative today. But I'm saying entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, by definition, are solution providers. So, and there is this distrust between both. So it's time that we break that barrier of trust and, uh, and, and uh, partnership between the public and the private sector. And get them to sit together. And, and for a serious for a serious partnership so that we can address the issues and specifically of the youth so that they can become again the story of becoming generators of jobs rather than seekers of jobs um, you raise a few points I'd just like to quickly go back to some of the points made out if you fly to any Middle Eastern capital and sometimes not even the capitals second third fourth cities pick up the local magazine the first ten pages will be advertisements of, and excuse me, I may be slightly old-fashioned, ridiculous-looking buildings, apartments, developments, all kinds of things. Now, how many people in the region actually need those kind of buildings? I mean, we were talking about Egypt. Minimum basic housing, not there. The private sector doesn't want to get involved. And the problem is we don't have the and spirit. improved uh, compounds for guest workers and throughout the DCC. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's a serious problem. We have a copycat syndrome. One person succeeds, Dubai, and then you look at the rest of the Middle East, wants to be Dubai. Now, the question was asked, how long will it take to change? Now, I, <laughs> I'm fairly optimistic if we take the right steps, and you're absolutely right. At this pace, we're not going to get there. But I would raise the point, um, <clears throat> just in my family. My grandfather's world, totally different to my father's world. My father's world, totally different to my world. And this is Saudi Arabia, the most conservative country we, in, in the region. We've changed an incredible amount in 60 years. So people who say, we can't do it, we're not used to it, we're not able to do it, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. Now the problem, we, we, the solution, when it comes to education, is very simple in my opinion. We do not teach our people to think. And unless you ask the question why, you cannot be entrepreneurial. Why? And that's the key. Why? <laughs> <laughs> why? 
Do you want to and ask so His Excellency why you don't teach people how to think? No, I'm asking a question that is basic in today's world. Why can't we have more Hilmi Abu Aishas popping out out of Egypt? We do. By the way, I mean, look, uh, we're, um, I don't know, maybe we're tired at the end of the day, so we're, 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 we're throwing all sorts of negative stories. But uh, again, there, are Maktoub, there is Maktoub, who is an incredible company and is the Yahoo of the Arab world. There is Hilmi Abu al -Aish. There is Al-Hikma Pharmaceuticals, which is a very successful company. There is Nukul Brothers, which is a very successful Arab. company. There is well, there's Arabic, there's Al -Ghaim. There are many successful companies, but it's not about that. It is about the small and medium-sized companies. Mm -hmm. It is about the entrepreneurs that are popping out that are the biggest employers, by the way. Employment, employment generators are the small and medium-sized businesses across the developed world. And this, is going to, this will be the same in our region also. We need those small and medium-sized companies. We are not the best representatives of entrepreneurship at the end of the day because we all became big companies. So a, a young entrepreneur, and I, I, I was speaking to some of them this, uh, this, uh, uh, at lunchtime. Uh, you know, these are the guys that are, we're talking about a million dollars worth of revenues and employing 10, 15, 20 people. These are the people that we, we need em to empower at the end of the day. Uh, uh, this is what I was 25 years ago and 27 years ago. Uh, we need to hear their voices. I mean, uh, are we engaging the, the, the crowd around us? Thank you. Because they have stories. Thank to you. Tell. Thank I you for doing. Thank you for doing my job for me. I was. Uh, I was about to let you exhaust yourself of your incredible energy, and uh, then I was going to invite the crowd to jump in. <laughs> yes. Yes. But yes. thank you. Do we have a microphone, uh, uh, gentlemen and ladies from audio? Do we have a microphone for the crowd? The crowd. The audience. The colleagues here. Well, thank you, Fadi. You can, we'll, we'll swap. Um, can we start with this young lady in the front row? If you could just tell us, stand up, tell us your name and your company or your school or your whatever, and, and please make your point. Hi, New um, York. Okay, my name is Dilema Al Ghalib, and I'm actually the Saudi representative in the Global um, Change Makers Program. Um, it's as interesting as this and many other sessions are. As you said, you guys are focusing on the problem and not the solutions. And it's tiring us youth because in the end, we want to know what can we do, okay? And then you also make the point about the system that we're under, especially making the point that Saudi Arabia is quite conservative and coming from my part, but also speaking on behalf of the region. Um, we have a system of ministries and bureaucracies. So now when you want to introduce something like entrepreneurship, what you have is only the elite of society getting access to those opportunities and um, you know like uh, those opportunities and, and maybe the sponsorship of their ideas so how can we actually implement a system according to our bureaucracies and ministries that can actually aid the spread of entrepreneurship Lama, let me ask you what is it that we are not doing from your perspective what do you think you're we are not, not doing for you what i think you're not doing is you're not <laughs> listening to us honestly so after what tell us we after, want to listen after, I, after want attending to listen. let me let me tell you you, you need to tell us so that we listen okay after attending a few of the sessions in the world like now forum just starting today i realized that if young people were the leaders <laughs> we would have been better off <laughs> you guys <laughs> I'll go with that. What, what is it that we're not doing? What you're, you're focusing so much on, on defining words, on rhetoric like we discussed. You're focusing on, on trying to pinpoint the root cause when not really move, and then, and then the session ends. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sort of, it's, sort of, it's sort of like what, what Woody Allen uh, said about a Chinese meal. You eat Chinese food and you're hungry <laughs> half hour later. Excellent. But uh, no, your point is well taken. As a moderator and as a, as a person who's been around web for about 16 or 17 years, this is one of the more honest sessions I've attended. <laughs> this is pretty open. No, it really is. And, and a lot of these old farts have to first, <laughs> have to first um, diagnose and have a catharsis. And you're not an old fart. Well, but <laughs> We are. Thanks. But, 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 but look, no, no, I don't mind. No, uh, but, but they have to actually I, diagnose I am, it first. I am, you know, look, my, my, my sons are her age. What I want to, what, I, what she didn't, un she, you did exactly like what, what we're doing. You still didn't tell us what is it that you, you want to hear from us that you're not hearing. She said solutions. What is missing? No, I know, but what, what are we not addressing for you? Tell us about your problems that we need to address. I can tell you 
Hang on. Tell let's, us. Let's go yes. here. I, 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 I think. Challenge us. They are challenging you. I think we should turn this over to you. Uh, I don't want to challenge you. I tried to work for IMX, actually. I don't want to challenge you. This yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, you have a job. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm that's easy. Fine. Today <laughs> and tomorrow. To, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, my name is Dunya, and I'm uh, part of the Global Change Makers as well. Uh, I'm from Jordan. Uh, the thing is, uh, I've been working for three months. I gra graduated this January, and I'm not working. Uh, I'm now working. And um, the thing is, uh, I realized that I don't work for people. I'm going to start my own business. After two months, I realized that I can't work. I don't, I don't want a boss, a boss like, <laughs> reporting Great. to him. Like Excellent. Me. Yeah, then I went the long way with young Arab leaders and the online things to check on how to be an entrepreneur. And then I realized that the definition of entrepreneur is different from your perspective than my perspective. Because entrepreneur needs half a million or something to start it. No, I mean, small businesses will die. We are in a very capitalist co country. Uh, exactly. if, if I wanted to do, uh, uh, you know, a small business no. looks like Aramex, you will eat me in the, in the not, market. Not, not true. And that's certainly not the way the knowledge economy started. And Helmi's going to tell you why you're wrong. Helmi. No, I, I, I think we are facing uh, a bright future for small and medium-sized businesses, micro-businesses. I think in the opposite. What we see today is that the big conglomerates and big, big businesses in the world are not uh, changing fast enough, mm. are not innovative enough. It's not about administration anymore. It's about change. If you look, and what we learn in school is business administration, and we should learn change management, innovation management. And I think it's exactly the time for entrepreneurs, for small startups, to provide a, a, a service immediately. But our friend here is both right and wrong, actually. She's but wrong because you don't need to have all that money, but you're right because probably the banks, the financial system, and the source of capital, even if it's small capital, in the Middle East is not friendly to people mm. like you. So Can I also add, bureaucracy is often not friendly. Not friendly. Um, All the time. With, with, <laughs> with, 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 with big established companies, and this is a very good point, they're there, they know how to work the system. Uh, a young yeah. so you know, but business but, but now we're still talking problems, and she's going to criticize this again. So solutions. Is microcredits and the use of additional microcredits for young entrepreneurs a solution? Look, and how do we make that happen? Look, look it's, not, it's not about microcredit. It is about medium-sized credit. So microcredit is, is, is not really that, because microcredit okay. is about the poorest of the poor. We need to go a step ahead. Okay, good. And, and, uh, so how do we achieve that? Uh, I, think Khaldun Tabaza, I think Khaldun Tabaza is a good guy to talk to us about entrepreneurship, because he is a venture capitalist. I, I think <laughs> <laughs> he is. Uh, thank you, Fatih. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but first of all, I'd like to go to one point that was proposed early on, which was about having three Middle East or five Middle Easts. And that goes straight against the concept of entrepreneurship, because entrepreneurs need economies of scale. And I haven't heard any of the panelists uh, comment on that point, and no. I wonder if people agree that we actually I don't think any of us are saying that you can't Middle have an economy East. of scale across all of the geographic region that is known as the Middle East. I think we were saying that culturally, socially, in terms of traditions, in terms of uh, practices, in terms of relative but wealth or less about, wealth. If we're talking about business here, and we're talking about, con I think it's very conventional to go and think into separating the region into three or five compartments, and it's unconventional to start thinking big. However, you know, I'd like to hear a comment about that, probably from the panelists. Okay. Uh, I'd like I'd like uh, to go to go on and talk a little bit about what Fadi what Fadi touched on about about venture yeah. capital and I think yeah. we do need venture capital but more importantly we do need the help that comes with venture capital that comes from mentors. I've got to structure this debate a little bit more so that we don't yeah. keep opening a new subject every minute. So exactly. So why don't you <laughs> bear with us sure. and let Fadi tell us first and then Asim tell us first what they propose to do. Somebody's phone is on. This means we have a half an hour left. Oh, okay. So let's hear proactively about how you get venture capital to young entrepreneurs in the Middle East in a solution-related way. The finance man should speak. Okay. Regarding solutions, solutions from the government initiatives, just giving you an example of Kingdom of Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain Development Bank, they have provided facilities for the entrepreneurs. They have very good success case scenarios. Some of them they went and they have been well known, even the... Sharm al-Sheikh World Economic Forum, they've mentioned their names. This is one element coming from financial institution by the support of the government. They do have 
initiative of what's called Tamkeen in Bahrain, which helps certain sectors to improve and get into the level of entrepreneurs. You do have the business community, governmental uh, support, which is in JAWS, is another level of comfort that it su supports by creating indirect corporate social responsibility through a platform from the government. Then all in all, the solution is there. The question is, where are the entrepreneurs with the right? Entrepreneur is, uh, is not an idea. One minute. It's not an idea that I have an idea without a systematic approach, that you have the full detailed study to come up and to raise it. Yeah, yeah, Fadi, yeah what, Fadi. what detailed study are we talking yeah. about here? It is, we're talking about the simple tools that we need to educate our kids with. The, the uh, Lama, Lama, right? Lama came to us and said, you know, we're, we're not... We're talking about how they get money. We, no, no. <laughs> solutions, Lama. Lama we're talking about how they get yeah, money And, and that's what businesses. we need to tell her. We need to tell now her. Now you're getting too rhetorical. Okay, so... Next. Okay, look, uh, uh, early, early stage capital, VC capital, is, 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 definitely, <laughs> is definitely a very important part of it. And, and making sure that we get early stage capital to people who, who have the right ideas, so the best ideas can win, How? Is, 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 is really critical. Oh, well, VC funds, uh, I, I think, you know, government banks, I'm a little bit skeptical about, to be honest, but I think getting, getting more early stage capital out there is, is, is very ease, important. Ease of but I don't, think, I don't think you're gonna get the early stage capital, if I take the words out of my mouth, yeah, I don't think you're gonna get the early stage capital until you can actually start a business. I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be honest here, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, may, maybe Bahrain is, is some really fast changing things that are happening that we haven't heard about yet. But starting a business in this region is incredibly challenging. If you're an entrepreneur trying to start here, the, the level of bureaucracy is staggering. I mean, us, we're, we're a very large company, and whenever we try to start up a new division, we have teams of people going out there, working with the ministries, trying to get the stuff done. It is, I couldn't imagine trying to do it while you're an entrepreneur, trying to keep all those different balls up in the air. It's absolutely impossible. Even getting a contract enforced. I mean, you're 120, 121 out of 180 countries okay. in contract enforcement. So if you're a small guy and you have a contract out there and, and you're just trying to get basic contract law put in, it's, it's extremely challenging. Sorry, guys. Um, there's a movie that Jim Carrey started in recently where he called The Yes Man, where he had to say yes. No, so, <laughs> so here's the deal. We don't want these young ladies and everybody else to be disappointed that all we did was describe the problems. We have another... So the government needs to step in. That's a solution. I want solutions and government suggestions. Step in. I mean, governments have to provide us, have to provide entrepreneurs right. a, a way to be able to go out there and, okay. and facilitate entrepreneurs being able okay. to open up businesses. Okay. Now, I have 11 different people I want to call on, and we have about 18 minutes. So I'm going to ask for people to be brief, direct their question or comment to somebody, and I want 30-second answers because there's a lot of people who want to talk here. I'm going to start with the gentleman all the way in the back there, and then we're going to go to a, a young lady who's sitting back here in the front row and then we're going to go over here let's just keep it moving people to believe in us i'm a budding entrepreneur i got uh, people investing in us from the silicon valley uh, very prolific angel investors now, uh, what I want to see in the Middle East, and it's a suggestion for you guys, I want to see incubators with very small capital. I mean, we've seen it work with the Y Combinator and Techstars and the Silicon Valley in Boston, where it's only 5K per engineer, 5K per idea. And then we take this to <coughs> another, another just point. The media in the Middle East does not believe in innovators, does not believe in media, and does not believe in entrepreneurs. We want you guys, you guys are successful. Just push the media to cover more success. Well, they hate us more than they do you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the first one was, was concrete. The second one was an impossible dream uh, for the time being. Young lady, right back here. Right back here. Good point. But a very good point. Both good points. Uh, come here, a microphone right back here, please. Coming around from the back. Well, I'm probably ignoring people back here. Hello. Um, my name is Lemis Badmed. I'm here from Saudi Arabia. I would like to share uh, a brief uh, part of my story. Last year for my graduation project, I invented a board game uh, that helps people learn about different historical sites in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it got a lot, of, um, a lot of attention from the media. And <coughs> I thought that I would get help, I'd get sponsorship. But the problem was, 
I got into competitions, and then they'd say, okay, this isn't a good enough invention because it's not science, uh, scientific. And then I decided, okay, fine, I'll copyright the idea and take it to the government. And I'd go and try to copyright it, and they'd tell me, no, this is not worth a copyright because this is not a good enough product. So here I am, I have an idea, I want, to make it, I want to expand it, I want to make it an electronic thing, I want to make it a company. I have hopes of making... You know, uh, uh, our colleagues here at, in, in Dubai are in the middle of that and, and, and uh, you know, we will come out of this. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so, there's still more room um, and more pain to go through. Um, and we will have to um, go through it. I mean, you know, in, in Bahrain's case, yes, w you know, th these, these fiscal deficits. But we were lucky enough that we came into this from a very, very strong position. Mm. So, you know, our debt to GDP was 15% or something. So even if you double it, mm. it's still a manageable um, uh, ratio. Now, long term, it's unsustainable. Um, and, and this is why we need to, to continue to fix it. And, and we are, um, you know, I didn't r say half the things I wanted to say because it's actually what what Jordan's doing, we're doing the same, be it, mm. you know, in, in teacher training and, and education and all of that. These are the things that matter and, and we're th that will generate a sustainable economy that will provide for a better future. And And... These are the things we have to keep working towards and, and um, uh, keep building on. And it is creating an economy. You know, one thing um, His Highness the Crown Prince uh, of Bahrain says is we need to move from the unearned income model to the earned income model. Mm -hmm. Move from digging a hole in the ground and spending the cash to creating a sustainable economy where real world economics applies. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're going through in, uh, in Bahrain. And this is why we have benefited. Because we were, we were less dependent on oil, we took a measured approach. Uh, you know, the UAE is 45% oil, um, sector of oil in Bahrain is less than 20. Um, it, it's, we are a bit more diversified. Um, we did not have as much leverage. Um, so growth, you know, employment in Bahrain in the first quarter was up. Um, trade volume in the port in the first quarter was up two to three percent, but still mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, so the the it is focusing on the fundamentals. What are your values? What are the, the fundamentals? And making people the solution, not the problem. And I think by focusing on these, we I mean you know we we now have one voice, and and, and other countries um, mm. w w will um, surely uh, um, add on. So. It is, uh, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, so we still have a bit to go, I think, in the problem. And um, if you if you know when, please let me know. <laughs> okay. I think we'll all like to know when this thing will end. Um, but uh, we just have to keep working, um, and we need the world. Uh, j you know, to, to to make it relevant to the topic, we need the world system to be more relevant to us. Mm -hmm. and not just the needs of the G7. Mm. Um, th it was set up uh, 50, 60 years ago, ser served that time, but it is not fit for purpose today, and we need it to change. Thank you. Saud? Yeah, <laughs> I think that, um, I mean, the engine of growth in the world is still the United States of America. Um, so uh, my view is that, um, I mean, if America does come out of this quicker than what most people anticipate, that will be um, a very good news for the entire world. Um, uh, they, they have uh, some significant problems, but at the same time they've done some significant steps to overcome these problems. Um, the, the key thing is about liquidity, I mean, today, if you see from October, there was no liquidity. Okay, today there's ample of liquidity in the world. Okay, but the only problem is that this liquidity hasn't moved from banks 
to to corporations, to customers, and 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 so we don't feel the benefit of it yet in terms of the economic uh, you know development. And it's going to take a while for this liquidity to actually sink into the system, you know. But uh, I think once you have this liquidity sinking into the system, you know, for example, you have now almost $5 trillion of money market funds, you know, just staying on the sideline, you know. Uh, well, at the same time, you have banks like United States, you know, the credit card utilization in United States in terms of lines is about uh, $5.2 trillion, it's gone down to 4.6 because a lot of banks are cutting down lines. Mm -hmm. So, th I mean, there are these, these fundamental things that they take time to really come into the economy. And I think uh, my view is that once the liquidity gets into the economy, once the, uh, the benefits of, of the liquidity are going to go to customers and corporations with a very low interest rate environment that we have, I think the potential for recovery is going to be much higher. Um, I, I'm not uh, so sure whether anybody can tell you that this is going to come in six months or in three months' time or in eight months' time. I think that uh, you know, the, if you were an investment company and you're looking at the world today, um, one thing you have to realize is that the, 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 the purchasing power of money has been at the highest level ever. You know, companies that had to be $200 billion about a year ago today, they're only $20 billion market cap, you know. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of opportunity actually to invest. Um, these um, changes obviously would impact our countries in terms of Middle East and all that. But I think in general, okay, uh, our Middle East as, as an economy has much more potential, okay, to rebound back much quicker than, than the developed economies, you know. So, I mean, that's my saying. We, uh, as a company, we're uh, looking much more towards the Middle East and the region in terms of investment opportunity. Uh, but uh, we still don't think that this one needs to be in a hurry today to invest. I think it's the point where you really want to see back. You do more, much more capital preservation and you wait till this much more, uh, a, a much wider economy has evolved and then you can make a much better decision. Mm. Daniela, from the World Bank perspective, to wrap up, are you uh, heartened or are you worried by what you've heard tonight? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm always heartened. No, I'm, I'm an optimist by, by, I'm a structural optimist. Really? But um, I, I actually would like to go one s step uh, into the future farther than, than my, my colleagues here tonight. Um, it's hard to tell now how long this crisis would last, and it clearly will depend a lot on um, the rest of the economy, not just on the response of, of uh, this region. But I think it's a real opportunity for this region to look at what it can do in this period to have the fastest possible rebound once the international conditions improve. And uh, well, maybe I'll get an opportunity to talk a little more about it on Sunday when I'm sitting on a different panel. But I do think that every country in this region has now some real opportunities to look at the future and try to address those constraints that will limit their rebound. And if they focus on that, and if they can really build um, on their strengths uh, so that once the global conditions improve, the economy of, the, of this region can rebound quickly, I think this will be mm -hmm. not a bad crisis. Mm. Well, again, to remind us all as we close that this session was part of the global redesign series that the World Economic Forum has launched to look in rather ambitiously at the redesigning the global system. Um, but the global system needs redesigning, as we've all um, experienced. And I think the challenge, as we've heard, is very clearly up to us in the Arab world to get our own house in order uh, at the domestic level and at the sub-regional level and at the regional level. If we're going to interact with the world and be taken seriously, we have to um, show that we can, uh, we can do this. And I think all of us believe that we can, but we're still all searching for the proper mix of policies and uh, mechanisms and political environment, economic environment, and, 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 and it's amazing how it all, every, every session almost you have in the Arab world gets back to education. It's tapping the human potential and unleashing the spirit of human creativity and dynamism and productivity. Um, and it's uh, obviously a challenge we all understand and hopefully we'll be able to address it better as we go forward. So please join me in thanking the panelists and thank you all for being here.
changing fast enough, mm. are not innovative enough. It's not about administration anymore, it's about change. If, if you look, and what we learn in school is business administration, and we should learn change management, innovation management. And I think it's exactly the time for entrepreneurs, for small startups, to provide a, a, a service immediately. But our friend here is both right and wrong, actually. She's but wrong because you don't need to have all that money, but you're right because probably the banks, the financial system, and the source of capital, even if it's small capital, in the Middle East is not friendly to people mm. like you. Can I also add, bureaucracy is often not friendly. Not friendly. Um, all the time. With, with, it, with, <laughs> with, with big established companies, and this is a very good point, they're there, they know how to work the system. Uh, a young yeah. so but, business but, but now we're still talking problems, and she's going to criticize again. So solutions. Is microcredits and the use of additional microcredits for young entrepreneurs a solution? Look, and how do we make that happen? Look, look, it's, not, it's not about microcredit. It is about medium-sized credit. So microcredit is, is, is not really that, because microcredit okay. is about the poorest of the poor. We need to go a step ahead. Okay, good. And, and, uh, so how do we achieve that? Uh, I, think Khaldun Tabaza, I think Khaldun Tabaza is a good guy to talk to us about entrepreneurship, because he is a venture capitalist. I, I think <laughs> <laughs> he is. Uh, thank you, Fadi. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but first of all, I'd like to go to one point that was proposed early on, which was about having three Middle East or five Middle Easts. And that goes straight against the concept of entrepreneurship, because entrepreneurs need economies of scale. And I haven't heard any of the panelists uh, comment on that point, and no. I wonder if people agree that we actually I don't have think any of us was saying that you can't Middle have an economy East. of scale across all of the geographic region that is known as the Middle East. I think we were saying that culturally, socially, in terms of traditions, in terms of uh, practices, in terms of relative but wealth or less about, wealth. If we're talking about business here, and we're talking about, con I think it's very conventional to go and think into separating the region into three or five compartments, and it's unconventional to start thinking big. However, you know, I'd like to hear a comment about that probably from the panelists. Okay. Uh, I'd like I'd like uh, to go to go on and talk a little bit about what Fadi what Fadi touched on about about venture yeah. capital and I think yeah. we do need venture capital but more importantly we do need the help that comes with venture capital that comes from mentors. I've got to structure this debate a little bit more so that we don't yeah. keep opening a new subject every minute. So exactly. You know, why don't you <laughs> bear with us sure. and let Fadi tell us first and then Asim tell us first what they propose to do. Somebody's phone is on. This means we have a half an hour left. Oh, okay. So let's hear proactively about how you get venture capital to young entrepreneurs in the Middle East in a solution-related way. The finance man should speak. Okay. Regarding solutions, solutions from the government initiatives, just giving you an example of Kingdom of Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain Development Bank, they have provided facilities for the entrepreneurs. They have very good success case scenarios. Some of them they went and they have been well known even the Sharm el-Sheikh World Economic Forum, they've mentioned their names. This is one element coming from financial institution by the support of the government. They do have initiative of what's called Tamkeen in Bahrain, which helps certain sectors to improve and get into the level of entrepreneurs. You do have the business community, governmental uh, support, which is in Jaws, is another level of comfort that it su supports by creating indirect corporate social responsibility through a platform from the government, then all in all the solution is there. The question is, where are the entrepreneurs with the right entrepreneurs? It's not an idea, one minute. It's not an idea that I have an idea without a systematic approach, that you have the full detailed study to come up and to raise it. Yeah, yeah, so Fadi, yeah what, Fadi. what detailed study are we talking yeah. about here? It is, we're talking about the simple tools that we need to educate our kids with. The, the uh, Lama, Lama, right? Lama came to us and said, you know, we're, we're not... We're talking about how they get money we, to start yeah. business. No, no. <laughs> solutions, Lama. Lama we're talking about how they get yeah, money and, and to start business. And that's what we need to tell her. We need to tell now her. Now you're getting too rhetorical. Okay, so... Uh, okay, look, right. I, 
Fair. Early, early stage capital, VC capital, is, 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 definitely, <laughs> is definitely a very important part of it. And, and making sure that we get early stage capital to people with, who have the right ideas, so the best ideas can win, How? Is, 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 is really critical. Oh, well, VC funds, uh, I, I think, you know, government banks, I'm a little bit skeptical about, to be honest, but I think getting, getting more early stage capital out there is, is, is very important. Is, is but I don't, think, I don't think you're gonna get the early stage capital, if I take the words out of my mouth, yeah, I don't think you can get the early stage capital until you can actually start a business. I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be honest here, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm may, maybe Bahrain's, some really fast changing things that are happening that we haven't heard about yet. But starting a business in this region is incredibly challenging. If you're an entrepreneur trying to start here, the, the level of bureaucracy is staggering. I mean, us, we're, we're a very large company, and whenever we try to start up a new division, we have teams of people going out there, working with the ministries, trying to get the stuff done. It is, I couldn't imagine trying to do it while you're an entrepreneur, trying to keep all those different balls up in the air. It's absolutely impossible. Even getting a contract enforced, I mean, you're 120, 121 out of 180 countries in contract enforcement. So if you're a small guy and you have a contract out there and, and you're just trying to get basic contract law put in, it's, it's extremely challenging. Sorry, guys. Um, there's a movie that Jim Carrey started in recently where he called The Yes Man, where he had to say yes. No, so, <laughs> so here's the deal. We don't want these young ladies and everybody else to be disappointed that all we did was describe the problems. We have another... So governments need to step in. That's a I want solutions and governments suggestions. Step in. I mean, governments have to provide us, have to provide entrepreneurs a, a way to be able to go out there and, okay. and facilitate entrepreneurs being able okay. to open up businesses. Okay. Now, I have 11 different people I want to call on, and we have about 18 minutes. So I'm going to ask for people to be brief, direct their question or comment to somebody, and I want 30-second answers because there's a lot of people who want to talk here. I'm going to start with the gentleman all the way in the back there, and then we're going to go to a, a young lady who's sitting back here in the front row, and then we're going to go over here. Let's just keep it moving. to believe in us. I'm a budding entrepreneur. I got uh, people investing in us from the Silicon Valley, uh, very prolific angel investors. Now, uh, what I want to see in the Middle East, and it's a suggestion for you guys, I want to see incubators with very small capital. I mean, we've seen it work with the white Combinator and Techstars in the Silicon Valley in Boston, where it's only 5K per engineer, 5K per idea. And then we take this to <coughs> another, another just point. The media in the Middle East does not believe in innovators, does not believe in we want you guys, you guys are successful, just push the media to cover more success. Well, they hate us more than they do you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the first one was, was concrete. The second one was an impossible dream uh, for the time being. Young lady, right back here. Right back here. Good point. A very good point. Both good points. Uh, come have a microphone right back here, please. Coming around from the back. Well, I'm probably ignoring people back here. Hello. Um, my name is Lemis Bajmed. I'm here from Saudi Arabia. I would like to share uh, a brief uh, part of my story. Last year for my graduation project, I invented a board game uh, that helps people learn about different historical sites in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it got a lot, of, um, a lot of attention from the media. And <coughs> I thought that I would get help, I'd get sponsorship. But the problem was I got into competitions and then they'd say, okay, this isn't a good enough invention because it's not science, uh, scientific. And then I decided, okay, fine. I'll copyright the idea and take it to the government. And I'd go and try to copyright it. And they'd tell me, no, this is not worth a copyright because this is not a good enough product. So here I am. I have an idea. I want to, make it, I want to expand it. I want to make it an electronic thing. I want to make it a company. I have hopes of making... I have crazy ideas, making a theme park, making... I have... You got the message, ideas. thank you. Good. Sir. Uh, without perhaps sounding too liberal, can I have your number? <laughs> 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 Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this is a valid point. I started up a company yeah, and being in the position I'm in two years ago, and I can't tell you what I had to go through myself. And I would call the minister and say, what's going on? And he would say, what do you mean? You should just follow the rules. The rules work. 
And you know, if, if I have to go through that difficulty to start up a company, I can only, you know, I feel very sorry. I'm, I, I apologize. Okay, we're going to have an <laughs> offline conversation Give after the money. seminar. Gentleman in the last row back there with the wavy white hair. Yes, he's an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> It's nicer than saying scruffy. <laughs> <laughs> no respect for moderators anymore in this. <laughs> Please. My name is John Francois Begin. I come from Geneva, and I am the casual observer of the area. Uh, there's one point that these ladies have made, which I tend to disagree with, and n none of you seem to approach the problem in a way I would have. Both of you, the initial ladies, seem to suggest that you expect from this panel the suggestions as to how, go, how to go about it. But none of you seem to be, with the exception of the lady just spoke now, willing to take the risk. And my question to you is, in changing the mindset, is it not a question of learning how to accept risk and to take the risk, not to, accept, to expect people to give you the advice on how to go about it? Okay, who wants to take that here on the panel? Help me. I, I, I fully understand the point. I, I think that uh, one of the things which we already mentioned is that we have to introduce uh, a spirit in our education system and everywhere, a spirit where people are ready to take ownership of their destiny and where they are taking their own decisions. In the last 10 minutes, we'll have five interventions. Gentlemen in the cream-ish, beige-ish suit. Hi, my name is Jihad Ayush, and I'm a student at the University of Florida. I'm Palestinian, actually. And um, I also wanted to start with uh, um, my story and then uh, kind of give suggestions. Um, every time I come back every summer to the Middle East, um, after spending a year in the US, every time, and I don't want to criticize, I feel a huge level of negative spirit among the youth. It's almost like you live there for a year, and you feel the energy, you feel the empowerment, you come back here and you feel that the youth don't want to do anything because they don't feel um, empowered enough. And the way I was looking at it is the three reasons in my, in my assessment are um, social security, establishment of social nets. You were talking about none of these people want to take risks. No, a lot of them would, but the reality is very different here. Uh, social codes don't accept uh, these kind of things. Um, earlier on this actual event, I was talking to... Uh, um, a head of a company and I was telling him uh, about a certain project I'm trying to do and he was telling me no go through employment first work hard and then try to do it now the funny thing is can you I identify that person is he in the room <laughs> no he's not he's not he's not um, the funny thing is it was so easy for me to get a lot of thousands into non-profit because a lot of organizations here in the Middle East look nice well but wrapping try up, to look your, nice. your point is my point is uh, you need to empower them, give them tools, internships, um, not just accept them uh, to have ideas. Give them actual internships, actual Everybody experience. agrees with that on the panel. No comment required. Good point. Good. Young lady right next to him. Hi, I'm Shema Kogash. I'm from the UAE. And I work as a researcher for a federal... I work, for, I work as a researcher for a federal government. But um, well, basically, my question is summing up what everyone here is asking. And it's, you know, how do you break the challenge or you know, the barrier to entering markets for potential young entrepreneurs? So maybe if you can sum it up in five points, that would basically answer Let's try question. to sum it up in one point from each one, and I'll rephrase the question. If you're not well-connected, because even being well-connected doesn't necessarily it guarantee takes, you get things done. It takes one day to start a business in Hong Kong. I don't understand why can it take one day to start a business in the Arab world? I mean, what's, what's the secret? What is this that we have well, against starting businesses? The truth is that, <laughs> the truth, why? The truth, the truth that is that in, 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 in a dozen countries in Western <laughs> Europe. I don't care about Western Europe. I care about Jordan and Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. I mean, let the Western Europeans do whatever they want to do. Well, I'm just going to say that issue. many of them have had the same problem. Well, good that for them because that's why Western Europe is suffering much more than the region is today because they have massive so social nets and entrepreneurship yeah, is under threat. But that's another, that's, under, that's another that's that's another question okay. altogether. Okay, can we answer the question here? Tell me. These five points. I will. I will give you my four points. Here they come. Uh, as, as I said. Uh, Start with an education for entrepreneurship. Second, give some support, technical assistance, coaching, or whatever. Uh, provide access for finance. 
put the entrepreneur in incubators. These are all steps which can be done, and there are uh, in Egypt at least some okay. uh, systems for this. Okay. And but have mentors, and have a network mentors. of angel investors, because all of us are investors. We need mm -hmm. to be angel investors and take risk ourselves. I'll, I'll put the responsibility on us here five on the on and this you're table and put say your money where your mouth I, is. And I am an angel investor, so I'm not shy about that, and okay. I've made a lot of money by doing that. So. Say your name as well, please. Uh, my name is Khalid. I'm from Syria. Uh, you talk about social development. Well, this is a problem I have with you guys. <laughs> you just, you just. What you is just, this? No, no, no. You, you just, you You're just the one who dictate. Said I'm joking. I'm joking. You just dictate how society should develop. You just don't, you know, like when you invest in a social development, do you enable society to develop into what it wants to be? I mean, this is something Fadi did in Jabal and Nadif. He actually enabled. Uh, an initiative taken by the public to take place, and he did not dictate. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, 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 fan like, clubs I really here. doubt. I, I, I really doubt Egyptians actually are looking for, you know, saving energy in buildings. They're looking for much more basic things than that. So I mean, like, get off the panel and go down and look at the people, <laughs> talk to intellectuals, talk to society, talk to uh, social organizations, and enable them to do what they want to do. Enable her, enable everyone else to do what they want to do. Anybody want to comment on that, or should we move on to the next? No, uh, we agree with him. We agree. All right, last three. This gentleman here in the front. I would like to, my name is Riccardo Monti. I run a managing consulting firm. Uh, we are in the region. We go around. We hire people. I'm optimistic. I share your view that I think a generation would be enough. 25 years ago, in China, there were no entrepreneurs. And now there's uh, many, many great entrepreneurs. So I think... I see all the factors are there. Young population, all the enabling factor, the whole, the whole region is going on the internet. Women want to enter the world of uh, you know, companies, but they feel in company they, their role is not good enough, so they want to do their own thing. So I think all the basic factors are in place for seeing in the next 10 to 15 years a boom of entrepreneurship in the region. So uh, at the end, I'm pretty optimistic. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, all, Omar. all the factors are there, and, and I agree with you. There's a young population. I think there's no will for change. And there's no will for, for affecting change in the coming generation. So we're just, we're just expanding the size of our society, but we're not changing the structural issues at all. So I'm beginning to agree with the young ladies that all you guys keep doing is describing why things won't change, why the structure is so better. We all what? know it, it, it is too rigid. But how do you change that? Our government needs, our government needs to step in and, and affect this change. Our governments need to but, be but able can to... I, can I Sorry, who's going to get I your government to do that? You that entrepreneurs exactly. have to get out there and I, talk I, to I them. I think it's time that we become activists and we start lobbying and we start uh, uh, going to our governments. We, uh, all the ministers here are our friends. We can go and lobby the heck out of them so that they can understand. Because many of can them, by the way, the look, look, I can tell you, I have, I have minister friends here who are in the private sector. What and happened to them? The what happens to you when you go to the public sector? Well, they won't have, they what won't happens? They won't have a job you were, anymore. You were here. They won't have a job anymore. Can you, can we, <laughs> <laughs> can we get a microphone to Why? this Jordanian minister Why? here, please? Why? Um, Why? They know, they sir, know the issues. Can we introduce your friend, the minister? No, this is a good minister. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Look, I don't and he's the Minister of Environment. So. I'm the and, Minister and of Environment. Is, I think, I his think name is Khalid Irani. Uh, my name Ali. is Khalid Irani. I'm Minister of Environment sure. in Jordan. I believe the, uh, the private sector should be more active in advocacy. I mean, uh, uh, we have so many meetings with the private sector. We, we, we want them to be advocate, they, to come up with a list what they want. And they should continuously do that. There is strong really need. I'm, I'm not uh, bailing out the government. I, say, I think there is a, a strong role of the government to step in and try to change, but it needs the private sector partnership to do that. We cannot do it by ourselves. And we need them to come and come together. I mean, how many people went, uh, went, uh, and, and, uh, went to the elections? From, from we, we always complain, but we don't try to change. We should go, the young chaps who are eligible to go and to elect, they don't. And then we complain about the governments, we complain about the, uh, uh, so the as parliament. A, as a minister, but we, what we are need you to suggesting? I'm saying that private sector should always engage with the public sector but and try to change. That we engage in with you. No, no, we, they are engaged. Some of us do. But okay. since I have the floor, I want to commend <laughs> really, <laughs> since my mouth is open, I want to uh, uh, really commend what Helm is doing and what he mentioned about the challenge of climate change. And I believe really the private sector should invest a lot in, in, in green, uh, green, green energy. 
But one thing, uh, uh, the, the, real, uh, the, the nature services should be costed as a, as a global policy. We need to cost for the nature services. Otherwise, the green policy will not work. Thank okay. you. The, uh, the, the my masters from the World Economic Forum are telling me five, six minutes maximum. So I have, um, I, we can't, everybody can't speak. And I'm thrilled that we have we such have an excited, meeting. engaged thing. We have the gentleman there with the mustache, and... Um, well, all Arabs have mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> I avoided making a comment about his relative hair. You could have said that the gentleman who I look at the mirror and I see him. Well, that that, that fits very well. Um, well I am actually out. Fadi Ghandur's conscious, so that's my name. Um, I think oh, listening... But so I'm in good hands. Uh, you are in good hands. I've, I was asking him this morning, because Fadi Ghandur, to keep him quiet, you need his wife to be here. <laughs> I've been in panels with Fadi Ghandur where he's like a soft pussy. He sits around, doesn't say anything. He does not cat, by the way, so <laughs> don't take it. Oh uh, my he's, God. He's, 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 be, he's very quiet. Um, <laughs> I think listening to the young ladies and young, in America. Yeah, young ladies and young, uh, young guys here about solutions, I think let's not dream. Being an entrepreneur, by definition, is not something which is just going to come up. You gotta work damn hard to get there. You gotta basically push yourself. The question of solution, you expect solution from these, you call them old farts. I agree with you, we're all old farts. Don't expect anything from us. Asking the governments to do something, the governments will do nothing. Sorry, forget it, Fadi. You, um, Fadi, you know this and I know this. Governments will do nothing. You, in our last five who? minutes, you're just giving us more negative. No, 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 I'm not being negative, I'm being positive. You gotta guys, I mean, you young people, if you're going to depend on these guys, or you're going to depend on the government to do something, you get nowhere. You got to depend on yourselves. You got to work damn hard and get there, and that's the way to do. And one question uh, you asked a question, by the way, and just to be fair to my brother Hassan, because I've got the copyrights for answering any question on Islamic banking. And if you want to answer to get the answer, <laughs> tomorrow come to CNBC debate, you get the answer. But please do not take the road off. We need the governments to do this, the governments to do that. Most of your governments are unelected governments, whether you like it or not. So you need these young people to move and move fast. Yeah, yeah. Thank all right. you. Well, we're all letting it hang out here today. Um, <laughs> um, last two comments, one from the back, and this young lady, and that's it. So one, two. OK. My name is Ashraf Al Ghazali. I work for uh, Unilever, general manager for the Levant, Iraq, and Sudan. And at the same time, I'm the board of the Egyptian Junior Business Association. I'm very much provoked by uh, the panel today because of two things. One, uh, the fact that uh, we're being too negative, and I come from an association where we believe we have hope, we have a lot of hope, and we believe our role is to disseminate hope and to show how things can change and how we can make a difference. The second thing is relying on government, and we have an experience where when we went to the government, with problems, clear solutions, and we're willing to go and work hand in hand and solve them, it works. I'm sure that we have, we cannot go and say the problem is with all the governments of the region and all the ministers of the region. <laughs> if we say that, then there's something wrong in ourselves. So we have to take responsibility and go, and things will happen once you do the homework. Number two, don't be negative. Just put KPIs. We've had some very good ideas on education, for example. Couple, put them, KPIs, work on them, things will move. I think that's great. I'm not sure the KPIs will pay the rent for her non-existent business, but um, <laughs> last comment. My name is uh, Noor al Musawi, and I'm from Iraq. Um, I'm graduated from Medicine Medical University last year in Baghdad, and um, I'm also a co-founder in Iraq Health Aid Organization, founder of my mother. And I'm interested also to say that in Iraq, in my case, um, social work is very recent since war. And for me, I was introduced to NGOs and social work since the war. And I've been very, I'm very honored to be here, the only Iraqi, and I give this the credit for Jordan and living in Jordan, between Iraq and Jordan, for all this social work. And among my experience, I, I need to have role models to, because I'm interested to help my country. And I'm also thinking of the future of Iraq when I see people coming from Lebanon with craft, um, um, project for recycling. I, thi I think in my country we have lots of opportunities for recycling. I think, and among many of the issues that I've been interested, peace building, computer literacy, all many issues that have been tackled in the Middle East. So your are point, in the point, you would wish the point is, for, exa for me, um, I'm taking role models from the countries around around me to in order and ideas to implement in my country. Yet I also think 
climate change is not um, is not well addressed and um, seeing the fact that in Iraq it's very hard because it doesn't serve the community but also to see role models in the countries around I don't see any and the fact that um, Mr. Fadi said about um, real estate building we don't have parks here <laughs> we don't um, we have maybe one park and the places we have even cultural places where I go to see and suddenly I see sometimes buildings next to them so this also doesn't give me the motive to start and even countries around talking about nuclear energy and that's not the very sustainable <laughs> form of energy this is all for me is I still would well, like we're, to we're see more encouragement. We're very happy to have you here and thank you for those comments and a round of applause to you <laughs> and good luck can, to you. Can, can um, I make a five second, sorry? Can I make a five second uh, comment about hope? Um, can I ask a general question? How many people here five years ago would have believed two Saudi women would stand up and ask questions of a forum like this? That gives me hope and the hope is not in the role models that are asked. You two are the role models that we need to look forward to. And uh, the more of you, the better, inshallah. I wish you both success. Okay. On, that, on that note, it, it is my duty, whether you like it or not, to try a 60-second summary of this, this session. So in one minute or less, here we go. We asked the question of a group of successful and aggressive uh, entrepreneurs whether unconventional capitalism, that which is less traditional and more entrepreneurial, is being affected by the global economic crisis whether the backlash of the forces of conservatism will uh, damage that trend or not. None of the panelists answered the question accurately. But over time, it became clear that that was the wrong question to ask. The right question was to ask, why isn't there more entrepreneurship, more educational, more opportunities, and what do we need to do to change that? In the course of the debate, various solutions were suggested, always coming back to empowerment, education, and trying to reform governments and rigid systems of bureaucracies, which in different countries have different potential success uh, for change. There are some countries where it will not change for 40 or 50 years, other, change, other countries where it could change in five or 10 years. And we have a very enthusiastic audience. I thank you all. Inshallah, we'll do this again next year.